So Josh, if engineering were a cheeseburger with onion sauce, you would be the hot yellow petroleum-based cheese product <laughs> dripping from the undercooked bacon. <laughs> uh, welcome to Engineer vs. Designer. The podcast. For engineers, designers, makers, breakers, and uh, those who design a paper-based 3D printer, I am Josh. And I'm Adam, and as always, we'll be making fresh product design smoothies from the squishy Ooh. stuff between the ears of our esteemed guests Yum. this week. We have the great pleasure to speak with the one and only Connor McCormick, CEO and co-founder of MCOR Technology. Makers of the paper-based 3D printer currently in use at Staples locations around Europe. We'll start with a design history lesson courtesy of SolidSmack.com. Sure will. Followed by a cool uh, design area tip talk uh, courtesy of CADJunkie.com. Where I might attempt to recite the entire Latin alphabet backwards with a mouthful <laughs> of extra crunchy peanut butter. Uh, sounds as uh, I so sounds often messy. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of eating uh, throat-clogging uh, plant matter. Josh, uh, massage the bulging udders of ignorance with the powerful <laughs> dairy farmer hands of knowledge. What have you got for us this week? This episode of Engineer vs. Designer is brought to you by our very own CAD junkie. If you want to learn of black belt ninja skills in SolidWorks Moto Rhino or how to sketch footwear using Adam's patented photo illustrator technique, check out over 50 hours of video training at cadjunkie.com. Ah, and uh, you know what? We've sent out a tweet for this episode, as we do. We have. Anyone who retweets that message will be entered into a drawing for a schmancy fancy engineer versus designer t-shirt. Made of gold thread. It's true. Last week's winner. And cotton. <laughs> Mostly cotton. <laughs> Last week's winner is Nick Hunter. Nick Hunter. Nick Congratulations. There you go. You could be next, you listening right there with the earbuds in your ear holes. <laughs> Head over to twitter.com slash EVD1 or click the link in the sidebar. Yep. As you know, we're talking with MCOR Technologies CEO Connor McCormick this week. The guy went from aircraft engineer to printing 3D stuff out of paper. Very cool stuff. Wow, indeed. So uh, this week we're going to bring you the history of mm -hmm. paper. <laughs> Actually, not not really. That that would be really yes, long. Yes, instead we're gonna we're gonna talk about cutting paper instead. How about that? Sounds good. Well, all right. The oldest surviving paper cutout uh -huh. is a symmetrical circle from the sixth century, Xingyang, China. The oldest you know. surviving uh, paper cut ba dates back uh, almost exactly that far. <laughs> <laughs> now, the craft uh, filtered throughout Asia and Europe, where many countries developed uh, their own style of paper cutting. It's been used for everything from religious decor to furniture templates. Funeral ceremonies to embroidery patterns. Now, Turkey boasted a uh, guild devoted exclusively to the task of paper cutting. Wow. And in 1582, it displayed a portable garden made entirely of cut paper flowers. <laughs> Insane. Yep. Now, a uh, Danish storyteller, you all know him, Hans Christian Andersen, was mm -hmm. an avid paper cutter himself. Yep. You can see a display of his work at his home in Odensk, Denmark. Mm -hmm. And the Swiss even developed a method of layering uh, cut paper in a type of collage, like three-dimensional collage technique, very similar to this 3D printing stuff. Ah, Lee Hongjun is a modern-day paper artist creating surreal sculptures from layered paper. And you can't forget the colorful craft of Maud Van Tours, who uh, also does this layering paper after paper and cuts through them to reveal these wonderful shapes and patterns. Just amazing. And actually, if you want to go back and listen to a fun engineer versus designer episode, check out episode 12 from October ah, 17th of 2011. Yes, That's uh, Robert that Sabuda, pop-up book designer, does incredibly cool stuff with paper that you would not believe. Yeah. Definitely worth, uh, worth a listen. Yeah, he does. You know, imagine if uh, the ancient Chinese had one of these printers. I imagine we you know? would see some... Uh, I don't know, masks and dragon yeah. costumes. Yeah, you could really uh, use a paper mask right now with, mm -hmm. without a mouth hole. <laughs> Come on. This episode is, of course, brought to you by Cad Junkie. If you haven't visited the site in a while, uh, we've been doing some major upgrades in the last few months and have been pouring out great new real-world project-inspired SolidWorks and moto training. You definitely want to go check that out over at cadjunkie.com. And um, yeah, so I, you know, 
Josh. Yes. Uh, I actually, uh, in my in the room next to me right now, I'm actually looking over at it. I have I a it. MakerBot Replicator 2 3D printer um, sitting on my shelf, and it looks really nice over there. Uh-huh. And that's most of what it's been doing for the last few days. Just sitting um, there. Looking really nice. nice. Yeah, it looks nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Giant $2,500 paperweight. <laughs> You know what? It's a super cool thing. And if you print any of the default objects that come on the SD card, uh-huh. boy, uh, is it cool. Because like, I've got uh, this little, the, the little nut, the nut and bolt that come on there. Yeah. It's like there's there's a nut and a bolt and you print them out and they can go together. They screw together. Ooh. And there's a really cool like knurled fancy. texture on them. It's very fancy. And, and it comes out perfectly every time. It's great. Mm-hmm. The problem is that whenever I go to print something that I've made, um, the results are not so Jacked great. Up. I've been having a <laughs> lot of trouble. Yeah. I've been having all kinds of problems. So there's a and certain actually, amount of preparation that goes into printing a model. Yeah, there totally is. Um, so the first thing that I figured out with this thing is that, and I'd actually kind of anticipated this problem, but I was curious how they would solve it, is the lack of support material. So, Very so important. on uh, a lot of 3D printers, um, you know, like, well, there are tons of different processes, but m- most of them have some kind of support built in where if you have undercuts and stuff like that, you know, those things will be kind of, there won't be hovering out in space where they just fall. Whereas mm-hmm. with the MakerBot, there's no support. So if you tried oh, to man. model something out in space, it's just squirting plastic out into the open air and it will do that. <laughs> If you tell it, if you give it a program with no support built onto it, it'll just start squirting plastic out into the room. And I have some great photos of this hairy, <laughs> blobby mess that it makes when it does that. And um, so you have to build in support. And right. the software can do that, but it, it's, it's kind of excessive and, um, and a pain to take off. So I don't know, man. It's, it's not well, been you, the magical experience I was expecting. Well, you can build in your own supports, right? You can, you, you can, you can use this, right. That so requires if you don't thinking, use, which yeah. you have some trouble at sometimes. <laughs> exactly, man. Well, I actually, <laughs> so I built, so I was going to build uh, a, uh, a tripod mount for my iPhone, right? right I on. designed a tripod mount for my iPhone so I could put it on my normal camera tripod. I thought this was a really cool application. So I started uh, by designing it, I started printing it out and uh, it kind of was too thin and frail and fell over. And so then I tried it again and again and again. I've done four or five prototypes and I can't seem to get this thing to work. I built supports in SolidWorks. I've actually gone to the effort of like actually just making all of the supports in SolidWorks so there are no undercuts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and just kind of making intentionally weak areas in there so I can break off the supports. Uh-huh. Nice. But uh, it's still, I'm still struggling with it. Still not there. Yeah. Huh. So that's that's actually we're we're about to talk with uh, Connor McCormick of uh, M Core Technologies. They make this paper based printer. What's cool about that to me is that it's it's a lot like Z Corp or some some other layering technology where you end up with uh, the paper itself acts as its own support material. Mm. You're not going to have any of this problem that I'm having. Yeah. Which is kind of great. Just actually. just sort of cuts it out. Everything's uh, self supporting there. Just take away the paper after you're done. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So anyway, uh, you know, for the I guess I would just say the MakerBot is incredibly cool, right? I got this thing. Uh, I I got the box that's really cool looking, and I pulled out. They, the packaging is really thoughtful and well done. Uh, it's really fun. You take this thing out, and it's super exciting. And it it take it takes literally. If I weren't taking photos as I were as I was unboxing it, it would have taken me five minutes to make my to be printing my first print. It, it's it's just incredibly fast and simple. And so I love the MakerBot and uh, I'm still hopeful that I'll learn how to use it, but it's not been as easy as I was expecting. So you might figure stay it tuned. out. If, if anybody has any tips for Adam, send them in. Please do. Please do. Well, Connor McCormick, thanks so much for being with us today. We have one conundrum for you as we start off mm. the show. If you could choose between having copious amounts of cottage cheese explode out your nose every time you sneeze <laughs> or involuntarily belch loudly every time you hear the word dinner which one would you choose (laughs) dinner belch (laughs) uh you're not gonna don't like cottage cheese oh okay Okay. (laughs) all right (laughs) okay Connor. before we get into the gritty details here uh who 
exactly are you and where did you come from? Where did I come from? Um, well, my parents probably have a different answer than right. that, but effectively... <laughs> Let's keep um, it PG. Yeah, so... <laughs> so, um, well, I'm, I'm from um, a little town not far from my factory here, a place called RD, A-R-D-E-E, in County Loudoun, Ireland. Um, my background is in engineering. Uh, you know, I've worked around the world before I kind of settled back here doing setting up MCOR technologies. So I've traveled around a bit, worked a bit in the US, um, always kind of wanted to do engineering as a kind of a main driver uh, all the way through my kind of school years. Uh, my father um, is a high school engineering or metalwork teacher, as he used to call them at the time, but a metalwork oh. teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, so always had a very keen interest in engineering. We used to you know, build motorbikes when we were kids, you know, strip engines mm, uh, from oh, nice. Honda 50s from, from when I used to have my brother when, you know, when I was like eight or nine, like working in the garage, getting things together. So I always really wanted to do that. And um, Now, I'm sorry, but, but to say you're an engineer, I mean, that's that's definitely true, but possibly an understatement as well. You, you I believe you have a PhD in mechanical engineering. Uh, can you yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about... The transition from uh, working in your dad's garage, stripping down motorcycles, to uh, to that kind of rigorous education yeah. experience. Yeah. So my uh, so I kind of went through the, the long way, kind of through college. I didn't go straight to university right off the bat. I went to kind of like a technical college initially. Uh, I got my kind of uh, technician background, and then I did a diploma in engineering, but it wouldn't have been a full degree. Uh, then I worked in the field doing technical drawing, as I was talking to you earlier, like drawing with ink and designing transformers actually for power supplies. Uh, and then I got the opportunity to, I got a career break um, and I got the opportunity to go back to college, go to university, um, did my de primary degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, then I traveled a bit into the US. I worked for a couple of materials handling companies. Hmm. It was probably giving me a lot of background information for you know, had to move things around and machines, belts and pulleys, linear slides, that kind of thing. That would be the basic, you know, nuts and bolts of what any kind of machine uh, for that we make now is kind of all based around that. And mm. then I got the chance to, to initially, uh, I applied to do a master's in aerospace structures and materials in Trinity College, yeah. which is a very uh, reputable university, the top in the country. And the course, actually, I got accepted, One only one of two people to get accepted onto the course. Wow. So the course didn't run because only two people went for it. So um, nice. the, head of the, um, the head of the department actually rang me up. I was in Philadelphia and said, would you like to do a research master's in um, using materials, using finite element analysis, uh, stress analysis of bulk metal forming, huh. of how materials kind of deform on the f load. So... I came back for that, and within the very within the first year, I transferred from my master's degree. I did a transfer report, and uh, if you can get past your transfer report, they'll enable you to transfer into a PhD. So, after my first year master's, I transferred into a PhD, and wow. uh, two years later, I got a PhD uh, using primarily finite element analysis to model uh, metal forming, how metal kind of forms under. Huge pressure. So that's really interesting. Actually, I'd like to take one step back to, to something that you're saying. I mean, it it's really unusual, at least with the people that I've spoken with, uh, to for somebody to go uh, to a PhD level and then not disappear into the ivory tower after that. You know, it's it seems like you've done an unusual thing by getting a PhD and then going back into making machinery. Uh, with, yeah, do you think that's uh, is that? Do you think that's unusual? Well, it was very important for me. I mean, I've always kind of chosen a road, a path in my career that would enable me to do real engineering. Mm -hmm. um, and when I got my PhD, um, I then started working with Airbus, um, working on the denting of the fuselage on the A380. That's wow. primarily what I spent my last very couple cool. of years before we set up MCOR. So we would uh, take a design... Uh, I wrote a program that would enable part of a fuselage by specifying various dimensions and stringers and thickness of the aluminum or whatever. It would build it up in 3D in the in the finite element package, and then we would 
uh, impact objects into it and see what the stresses were. And then when we had predicted the stresses, they would actually, Airbus would go off and build the panel, actually deform the panel to the to the level on the computer and then actually measure, see what the stresses were and try and pr- try and validate. The, so, it, yeah, I know a lot of people, like most of the guys that I would know in university would usually go into some sort of a management structure and they wouldn't really do any real engineering. It might be an engineering company, but right. they're not doing any relative engineering. So it was very important to me to to stick with that. Right. And uh, that kind of, uh, obviously that, that transferred all the way through to setting up MCOR. Well, how you transitioned into 3D printing is going to be an interesting uh, story here. But <laughs> from, first, from Airbus. Uh, yeah, yeah. First of all, riddle me this. The the top three execs at MCOR, you as CEO, uh, Fintan yeah. as CTO, and Deidre as uh, CMO, you yeah. all share the same last name, McCormick. Yeah. How it. are you guys related? <laughs> and should we assume that MCOR is a little bit of a play on your name there? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah so the Fintan is my brother. Um, okay, okay. So, and Deirdre's my wife. That's the simple. Ah. Yeah. So, yes, and MCO is a play. That makes sense on, now. Yeah, MCO is a play um, on the surname. And we also, what the, is an important, it sounds uh, kind of maybe obvious now, but we're, even from the very start of setting up the company, um, we see ourselves as an R&D company. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, where our strap line is MCO Technologies, unfettered innovation. And we really do believe that. We didn't want to name ourselves after a 3D printing type of technology oh, or they say a 3D printer because uh-huh. we believe that this company, you know, that we can come up with innovative ideas about yeah. a whole lot of other products down the line and Who potentially even what? into different areas. But mm-hmm. obviously, like taking one uh, <laughs> sector like 3D printing, you know, we have to uh, work and get through this one in the first place. But uh, just to give an idea that we, we wanted to pick a company name that was uh, – not necessarily associated with our 3D printers that right. would enable us to, to go into other products and for the longevity of the company. So on the topic of uh, 3D printing, your first technology, uh, how how did that evolve? How did you go from Airbus uh, into 3D printing? Then? Yeah, well, it was very... But my first ever um, introduction to 3D printing was a show in the UK called Tomorrow's World. Uh, and if you go and look in YouTube and type in Tomorrow's World, you'll see some of the uh, kind of early shows. But they would show all these kind of what if, you know, like flying cars and all these kind of things were going to happen, their predictions on it. But they had uh-huh. uh, one of the, I think it was in 86, they had a kind of a, it had the laser stereotography into the resin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just remember I was completely blown away by it. So from that point, if you fast forward to when I was working in Airbus, and doing some postdoctoral work in Trinity College, they had some three D printing machines both in the university and in the company, and um, we realized that at that time maybe only one student in the product design course at the end of their product design year would get the print out apart because it was going to cost a couple of hundred dollars or, or more or euros mm. to print out an object, and the same with the companies, even with the big companies. Um, they weren't utilizing them to the full extent that the whole idea of a 3D printer to print multiple prints, multiple different design scenarios and not really have to be worried about the consumable costs. Mm. Uh, you know, mm. I felt that that was uh, the missing key here, that uh, something really needed to change. And to move it from going from a couple, of, a, a few thousand of units per year well, like, why was it only doing at the time, you know, 3,000, you know, around 2,000, 2003, it was only around two to 3,000 units per year, every, like globally, which is, you know, ridiculously small number of printers. Right. Mm-hmm. And, well, uh, don't you think, I mean, I, let me let me play devil's advocate here for a second, because I, I'm not sure that uh, that my information corresponds with, with yours here. I think, yeah. you know, the capital cost of 3D printers was definitely very, very high. It was very inaccessible to buy a 3D printer from one of the big companies. Um, well, how many years however, ago was this? However, though? I mean, even even just, um, you know, uh, quite a while ago, you know, Z Corp was making printed parts out of cornstarch and super glue. They were cheap to make. The individual parts yeah. were cheap. And, and FDM printers as well. You know, you could print um, something for 10 or $20 once you had the machine. So, it, I mean... Yeah, it's all... Well, actually, I'll have to pull you up on that now. You pull me up, I'll pull yeah, you up. Yeah, yeah, by all means. <laughs> Uh, back in 2000, when we started looking at these machines and t- when we started coming up with the concept of the 3D printer, Fintan and myself, the two of us together at that point, um, 
you're talking about the machines would have been in euro, probably forty five to fifty thousand right. euro for a Stratasys machine. And the Z printers were probably a little bit cheaper, but not much. Um so as you you're correctly, like it wasn't just the price of the consumer, it was, it was the price of the machine at that point. Right. But we knew that uh that the consumables was the biggest part. Like you will be able to buy that machine, but if you're gonna be spending a lot of money every time you print something, that's gonna be a big issue. Now, if you fast forward even to you say now they're only a couple of bucks to or ten dollars or twenty dollars, like the cost per CC for something like ABS plastic, which is you know something that like with the maker bots and the kits and all that can get very, very a lot cheaper. Right. Like Stratasys and these type of companies, you know, you know, they've made a very big revenue revenue stream, maybe 40, 50 percent of their business is made up from the consumables from the revenue. Mm. So uh you might say that that part is cheap, but it'd be very small for something that's only going to be ten or twenty dollars. Uh-huh. Like if you want to be able to not to be constrained to the size of your print, to be able to print whatever you want, and um, that's what we wanted to do. That's what we wanted to mm. make a printer yeah. that the people didn't have to think what was it going to cost to make a part, and we knew uh, that at the time and it's it's changed a little bit now but it still holds true that people didn't really care especially in universities they didn't care what the 3d printer made it out of uh-huh. you know that those as you said there was cornstarch there was parters there was all these different technologies yet they were teaching it to their students but they couldn't afford to get the technology because they couldn't afford to run it in most terms that's the way we well so that's a, that's a perfect segue then so so tell us about the development of your 3d print technology it's clearly a very different approach from what's out there can you tell us about it yeah, yeah. So as you say, we looked at it completely differently. So we would view ourselves as having an inverted razor and blade model. So everybody else is reducing the price of their machine, and so the razors effectively are getting cheaper and cheaper. But the blades, you know, the consumables are going up in the opposite direction. So uh, it's what it's not enough in our view just to reduce the price of the machine. Uh, you have to also have very, very low running costs. That's the only way we believe it's going to happen. So we completely looked at a different angle, turned it upside down in its head, and we wanted to build a machine at that time uh, that was going to have effectively virtually very, very low uh, running costs that you wouldn't really have to worry about what you're going to print. So we said, what's the most readily available material that you can get your hands on? Uh, you know, that wasn't, wasn't depositing a layer of powder we weren't going to be going into plastics because of the cost of plastics and potentially the smell of plastics and all the things that you might have to worry about with plastics and with the powders, the dust and, you know, the, the you know, some of the complexities of that. So we said mm. sheet paper, everybody can grab their hands on a couple of reams of paper. You can go to your local office, you can go into your store, uh, you know, within a couple of minutes, you can grab your hands on a few reams of paper. We said, let's start there. Uh, so the sheet material is going to be paper. Uh, and we're going to use a water-based adhesive. So from the very first weekend when Fintan and I came up with the concept, it was paper and a water-based adhesive. Mm. And we said, that has to be simple. Like, how mm. hard is it going to be to stick a couple of sheets of paper together? <laughs> right. And it actually turned out to be one of the most difficult challenges because <laughs> a, a water-based adhesive, as the name suggests, is made up of water. And when you put water on paper, right. the paper blisters. <laughs> right, right. Mush. And to get around that problem, then we could have went down to a solvent-based adhesive that would have made our life a lot easier, but it wouldn't have been an eco-friendly printer. And right from the start, we wanted low cost and eco-friendly. So that was that was the starting point. Simply from that idea, let's pull in sheets of paper, use a water-based adhesive, and instead of using something like a laser that would cut the paper because laser and papers aren't a really great combination when you think right. of fire, fire potential. Hazard. Yeah. We said, let's just use a, a tungsten carbide blade. You know, we'll cut out the profile and we'll just go with that. And that was the start. Right. That was the start of the concept. In the early days, as I said, 2003, I was working in Dublin. Finton was working in Philadelphia. Um, we would, I would have, we both had our ordinary jobs. I would come home in the evening. Uh, we get, we had one daughter at the time, get, my daughter to bed and then I'd start working Fintan would come home from Philadelphia from his job and we'd start working through the night and uh, this was prior to Skype or any of those things we were using oh, three yeah. or four different packages one for Vice uh, one for sharing a desktop and something else we were able to get the whole thing kind of working wow. and when people talk about having an in-house machine the very first machine we built was actually in my house it was in the front room of my house 
Uh, it was all made room. out of extruded, yeah, it made out of extruded aluminum uh, kind of box action material that you bolted together. Uh, Fitton would send over the electronics, he'd build the electronics in Philly, send them over uh, FedEx and I'd attach it onto the machine and we'd try and get the machine up and running over the phone, which is quite interesting. Right, right. Wow. Uh, yeah, so I, we realized then in uh, 2005, 2004 that it wasn't going to happen doing it part time like we'd spent a year or two at it and it was like you know we had something that was moving over and back but you know it wasn't doing it so we made the decision uh, to give up to leave our jobs uh, we left both good jobs uh, in 2005 Finton came back from Philadelphia and we set up here then in Ireland and we we started the process then of of building the first machine so we we literally we worked in stealth mode um, for the first couple of years and then Deirdre came on board there's my wife now. Deirdre was working in, in advertising and marketing. She's a degree in marketing and a master's in advertising. So she was working in that area, but for different companies. And it was a perfect connection. We needed to get a bit of press around 2007, 2008 to get a bit of awareness for raising investment and to let people know what we're doing. So Deirdre came on board. Uh, there was a couple of strategic placements of articles and uh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make a 3D printer that ran on paper. Right. Uh, we got 2 million hits on a website in 10 days, uh, wow. completely oh. crashed the server. Um, so like nice. all of a sudden you could hear the emails coming in just every couple of seconds, bling, bling, <laughs> wow. emails, sales inquiries, sales inquiries. <laughs> so we knew happening? then, we knew then that people, if we could build this machine that people would want. If you build it, it they will come. That's it. So <laughs> and from that point, so that, that's, that's really how we got into it. But I know it sounds, you know, it might sound corny, but this is the truth. You know, we, we got into 3D printing to really upset the status quo. We didn't get into 3D printing just to go and say, this is how we're going to make a quick buck. Right. Uh, we felt that right. 3D printing needed to change. Now, this is prior to desktop factory. Uh, you know, n there was nobody else in our mind was doing anything like this. And if, uh -huh. and if you look back, and there wouldn't have been in 2003. Uh, you know, we realized that these big companies were making a huge you know kind of a profit on us right. people who Cash want cows, to print yeah. parts so yeah. we really wanted to make a difference and we felt that by doing this that it would enable that it would kind of open up that floodgates and now i think with the color that's another thing altogether with the new color iris printer we've we've taken you know what the machine is very good at you know function in a form and fit you know where people can have very smooth surfaces and parts that fit together and dimensionally mm. very accurate now we've We've put a layer of color information on top of that and we're we're breaking not only are we doing some great things in the commercial we're obviously into the consumer space in with a price point and a color part that really is uh, is impossible for them to get anywhere else now now uh, we I, sorry go I, ahead josh I, it, well it I, I gotta ask about this because it almost seems sort of an afterthought the the software side of the 3d printing um is, is your software easy to use do you develop it yourself how how are you guys developing that yeah, so it's <laughs> that sounds strange, but like we, we were so caught up for years this building machines and telling people that we were machine manufacturers. Uh -huh. It wasn't until a couple of you know maybe three or four years ago that somebody was in and we said, well, well we actually we write the software ourselves. So we're like we're software manufacturers. Yeah. Right? So we've the, right. the, the software started off. Fenton is the main driver on the on the software side. So it started off using like MATLAB uh, way back in like two thousand and three uh -huh. four. Uh, then moved over we use a bit of c and then it moved over to kind of java base and so now it's all so it's all developed here we have programmers here in house that uh, take the whole thing so we'll take wow if you don't mind me asking uh, how, how big is your development team the software side is very small it's only a couple of programmers but it, the main thing is the you know it's the thought processes behind it it's coming up with the algorithm it's it's coming up with how we're going to do this and then it's just oh, the yeah. implementation making it, it easy to use for the right yeah. right absolutely consumer. yeah and that, the things, that's the big the things, problem i think sure like the things we're doing now you know is optimizing and uh, you know opening up larger and larger parts you know because now with the color you know people are sending you know files usually a lot bigger now when you have the color information on top and right optimizing it and so it's just it's it's great stuff for me to you know to go out and to look at how the software has come on and every time you see a new rev of the software and all the things that it can do you know you thinking back to where it was it's, it's brilliant it's becoming a, a very nice product now i, I just yeah. want to 
uh, reveal a little bit. So obviously, you know, this is a really unusual and innovative way to uh, do 3D printing. There are some great advantages to it that you've been talking about, the cost being one of them, full color being another one now with the Iris uh, 3D printer. Um, mm -hmm. and then there are other technologies out there, obviously, and I think those still have a place, right? So where, oh, yeah. where would you say that the M core machine fits into a design process and where would you maybe want to go with a different, you know, go with an alternative? Yeah, I think you're correctly right. I mean, you know, there's estimates out there that the, the penetration of 3d printing at the moment is somewhere between 1% and, you know, an 8%. You know, and, and I think it's closer to the 1%. Sorry, 1% or 8% like of what? Of penetration of how big it could potentially to, to usage like there's very small amount of people that are using 3d printing that can be and should be using 3d I printing see. so there's loads hmm. of space out there for all the different types of technologies uh, you know there are some circumstances where people uh, need you know metal parts or there are some circumstances where they have to have plastic right uh, but realistically when you start analyzing uh, you know why people use plastic or why they use some other materials um, there's very few that just have to have that. A lot of the times, it's they want something that's really smooth. They want something that feels like a plastic part. Um, you know, and we can, you know, people have a misconception of what our parts are like. They either think they're going to be something like a paper mache uh -huh. or some sort mm -hmm. of origami type of folded <laughs> object. But actually, when you get this object in your hand, because we press really hard in the machine, building the layers, we're actually putting it back into almost like a wood-like structure. Huh. Uh -huh. So you can, you hold these parts in your hand, you know you have something that's, you know, solid and rigid, uh, a lot more durable than any of the powder technologies. You can throw them into your bag, you can fly with them, you can take them out and bring them to demos. You don't have to wrap them in bubble wrap or anything like that. Like these parts are durable. Uh, and if you treat them afterwards and do all that, you can, you can make them just look like plastic, I could give you parts that you would say they're plastic. That's injected molded or something else. You wouldn't wow. realize it. Yeah, the images but, on your site look. I mean, they look like they real look parts. really I mean, you impressive. Can't, you cannot yeah. tell yeah. their their paper at all. No, but I, I do think like where our machine fits in perfectly is that definitely at the early stages of the design cycle. So, if you can print multiple parts on a very early stage and capture all the things that you need to do before you go down to to another technology or to some traditional injected molding that is really where it fits in but the running cost on our machine and the, the, the total cost of ownership you know once you start running the machines over time you know you can easily take 10 or 20 percent uh, of the work of our competitors technology so if we walk into a company that has our competitors technology their running costs on those machines are so high that we can say to them even if you take 20 percent of the work that you put in that machine you can buy our machine and, and, and start making profit you know, the, the running costs are so different that uh, Air Machine can fit into loads of situations, a lot more situations than people might imagine. These aren't desktop printers either, like the Iris and the 300 Plus. Um, just to give a little perspective on there, um, I'm wondering, uh, are, you, are you ever going to be going into a desktop type of computer or... Uh, I mean, because how big are these? We've, we've got a video yeah. on Solid Smack, by the way. We're going to link to that so people can look at it, but... But can you can you describe how big one of these things is and kind of the footprint? Yes, the machine. I can give you the metric dimensions. Uh, it's approximately it's the machine itself is nearly a meter cubed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're correct. I mean, it does sit on a desktop, but it want to be a fairly good desktop. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a big um, desk. Yeah. Yeah, and we actually with the iris. If you've seen any of the images, it, it actually comes with a stand because right. we right. were uh -huh. enabling people to. You know, put the machine on their own table, and they can get their own desk, and they can. But with the Irish machine, it's an integrated, so that they get an actual table built into the process. So, okay. uh, yeah, the machine, the machine at the moment, um, is around 160 kilos. So it's uh, gotcha. it, right. it's big. a little bit, it's a little bit different. But saying that, it's oh. um, yeah, oh, well, actually, I was going to say it's it's not as bad as some of our competitors, but our competitors now right. have new machines right. that are smaller. <laughs> Smaller. Well, it's not as bad yeah. as but, um, some of your competitors, and others, yeah. it's, it's bigger. But I mean, it's yeah. it's not going to be but a portable think, item. I don't think anybody's yeah. expecting it to be portable. So right. yeah. So our, and, our, 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 obviously, I can't share too much on our on our future development. But like our whole right. ethos as a company is to our vision really is to, is to become the market leader. It's quite simple, providing low cost, eco friendly, and full color three D printers, hmm. and 
I think for the way that we are going to have to do that is that, you know, like all products, the machines are going to get faster and faster. They're probably going to get smaller. Uh, you know, they're going to potentially get a lower price. So this is what's going to happen in the evolution of our products moving forward. And uh, so I wouldn't say that that's out of the question in the future. Uh, uh, the colors of your prints rely on inkjet printing each page, though, right? Prior to actually cutting and, and gluing yeah. it all together. So isn't that part going to be, that's going to add a bit of cost to to the whole uh, process. Inkjet printing is assume. expensive, right? Yeah, well, actually, the, the um, it's all, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's another relative thing. So, yes, I mean, inks inks are, uh, okay, so the, the, you're correct. Air machine pre-prints, so pre-prints the, the ink onto the paper. Yeah, just for um, the so color the same, stuff. Oh, wait, now yeah, your so, your machine does the printing, does the, the inkjet printing as well? Yeah, so, well, oh. it's, it's a, it's a, it's a built-in printer. So in that stand underneath the machine, we have a regular 2D printer. Uh, I have the same software that controls the 3D printer that does all the control motions and the and slicing up the part also runs the 2D printer. So wow. uh, nice. when it's making one part, for example, say the 3D printer is making something, you can get started on the next oh, part. Oh, I see. You, you can print yeah. to the 2D printer. It only puts ink uh, where the cut is going to go. So we're very economic with the ink. So people would naturally have assumed that the, that the, the first thing you would have done is printed out like a lot of photographs of whatever you want to make, like full images over the whole sheet. Right. But actually, right. that'd be a very wasteful thing to do. So, mm. we only print the ink just on, on the, the edges. sheet. That, yeah. Just uh, on the edges, or if it's flat, yeah. like on, on the visible surfaces. Mm -hmm. And what's unique about our ink is that um, ink, most ink has uh, over the last 20 years all ink has been designed to sit on the top surface of paper so if you print it at a text it only goes down like a micron or so into the thickness of the paper if we did that with regular ink and you cut tr through the sheet you actually get white on the side you won't actually get a full color all the way through the print so a vertical wall after you put that ink down regular ink uh, you don't get your color on the vertical walls so what we have to do is that we have uh, invented our own ink. Oh, wow. So it's our own patented ink, um, and it actually prints through the media. So you have all those colors actually grown through the sheet of paper, each sheet of paper, so that when you cut, you get the variation of color actually through the sheet. So the advantage of doing that is that we can actually have the same resolution on the top of the sheet as we do on the bottom of the sheet. So we can print... Upside down images, we can print what? overhangs. Yeah, so we can print something like a, like a Sistine Chapel, if you'd imagine that. Um, mm. We will have the same resolution on the ceiling as we would on the roof. Wow. So we will have <laughs> the same detail all around, overhangs, vertical walls, and upside down. And that has been a big challenge of the Parador technologies. Yeah, um, I imagine. Because so. of the way they do their thing from one surface, we actually approach it from two sides, and we can get very high res. So that's one thing about the color. The second thing about the color is that color ink has been designed to run on paper. So it runs very well going onto white sheets of paper. Plus Air Machine uses four cartridges, CYM and black. So between the black and the white paper and all the colors in between, we have a huge range of colors, right. uh, up to one million colors, and a very high color fidelity. So the color that you get yeah. on your screen is going to be very similar to the color that you actually get in your printed part. So that's a very important part, and it's very that repeatable. Cool. That is very cool stuff. Beats hand painting it. Now, I mean, sure. and and the parts, the part, the photos of the parts that we see look just amazing. By the way, so I mean, that, that, there's you. no question that uh, that this works, and and it's that grapefruit it's really looks impressive real. Stuff. I tell you. Yeah. Thank you. So you got you guys have been hitting the trade show circuit pretty heavily this year. Uh, what what kinds of feedback have you been getting from professionals out there? What what's the good stuff? What's the bad stuff? What's the stuff that's been kind of shaping your your future plans? Yeah, actually, you know, we've you know we've been on the go now for a while, as you know. So, Air Force kind of shows. We started off in the UK going to TCT, uh, time compression technology show, every year, and um, and then we kind of ventured out into you know going into Europe. And last year, then we started our first US show. So it's a very important part to us is, is into the US market, but um, we kind of. At the trade shows, it's good and bad. So it's one story that does the good and the bad. Mm. So people, it usually goes through about three or four steps w when people come up to see us at the booth. <laughs> so the first thing they say is, um, you'd see somebody standing back from the from the machine, 
and they're talking to their friend and they say, oh, that's uh, SLA or they'll see the parts and they think it's some sort of plastic. And then you say, no, no. And you overhear and you said, it's actually paper. And I go, what do you mean paper? So that's the first point. <laughs> right. Then you show them, they say, yeah. and the very first thing that they say when they think it's paper, they say, well, what can you do with it? So you go straight yeah. over to show them the parts. You show them parts that are like plastic. You show them parts that are used for sand casting, parts that are used for investment casting, for vacuum forming. Wow. Uh, and then they go, oh, really? And what's the cost? Then you show them the cost, and then they go through a kind of a circle. And they come all the way back. <laughs> They come all the way back to the point where they say it's paper and it takes it. So the bad is there's a journey we right. have to bring the people through. But right. the good part is that when we bring them back, when they get back to square one, they can just see the whole, the whole thing just opens up. It's like mm. a light bulb goes off and they say, you know, oh my God, you know, we could <laughs> use this. And that, that's, that's the good and the bad in a nutshell. Oh, that's great. All right, uh, Connor, the maker revolution, yeah. you're part of it whether you know it or not. Yeah. <laughs> where where and how does uh, your product fit into to this yeah. uh, this new revolution? Well, I like to think, you know, as I, as I kind of alluded a bit to earlier, I mean, obviously things have happened lately in the last couple of years with the like of, you know, from rep rap to bit for bites to make a bot. Right. And, you know, that was mm -hmm. really obviously the start of it. But I think if you went back a little bit further than that, you would say Desktop Factory had a big impact uh, with what they were going to come out with. But I would like to think that we had a big impact as well and for people to start to think, hey, you know, we could do this. You know, we don't have to be relying on these big, uh, buying off these big companies and uh, them kind of, you know, making a lot of money on us on the consumable. So I, well, one way I'd say, you know, I'd like to think that we had a kind of a, a part of it way back in the early days. How we kind of fit into it now, I think it's brilliant that the maker revolution is happening and um, I think it's it's I'm embracing it you know it, it's a case of it's raising awareness uh, about the technology to everybody uh, it's not everybody's cup of tea uh, you know there are certain people that love the maker the kits and they use it and and they can get fantastic use out of it and then there's some that can't and as right. I said earlier like the penetration is so small there's there's enough for everybody. There's enough of a market for everybody to go after. So I think right now, uh, it's it's a it's a great space to be in. It's great to be a part of it, and I think it's you know it's very exciting how it's moving forward. I think in in the future, the whole maker, uh, you know, those entry level machines, it's going to be a dog eat dog down there. It's you know, like the machines are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. I remember when. You know, when Rap Rap and Maple Megabot were starting to come out first and like, you know, you're reading the blogs about it and guys saying, God, I'm not gonna buy one until I can buy it for a hundred dollars. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> like you're you're gonna you're and you're gonna get people that just you know they're not gonna use it until it kinda gets down into that level. But then, you know, what kind of business uh, is there for everybody at that point, uh, if it gets down to that point? I'm not really sure how that's gonna pan out. But yeah. Um, well, and we think, I, I mean, we're big believers that actually having them at home may or may not actually be all that productive for people. I think bureaus and also just corner stores like Staples, for example, are going to be uh, how, uh, how a lot of people interact with these things. And it happens that you guys have a pretty, uh, what I think is, I think it's a really big deal. You teamed up with uh, Staples very recently awesome. to offer 3D yeah. printing at uh, certain European stores that is um, envelopes cool. office chairs and 3d, and 3D prints. prints yeah <laughs> so t tell us about how you got that to happen and then uh, what's what's kind of the future of that yeah well as you said you know i think it's going to go in two different ways i think you're going to have people that will buy uh, the the machines at home the kits uh, and they're the kind of guys that uh, already are kind of into tinkering around with things and they might have things in the garage and drill presses and maybe a welder and electronics and they're kind of into that and and that'll go into other people that aren't kind of so much uh, maker type of community i know that will expand a bit more but i do believe that uh like i know people have a hard time programming their tivo or their 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 here right. with the skybox <laughs> you know and i can't like, imagine yeah. like my parents uh, you know, have a hard time using a phone. I can't imagine them ever uh -oh. or people like that, <laughs> you know, using a 3D printer at home. But I definitely do see that those kind of people would quite easily go down to a store like a Staples and say, here's a couple of images. Uh, can I get that a 3D print? Or here's mm. a, a, from my mobile phone app, 
uh, you zoom out around somewhere on Google Maps and say, I want that printed, like where I go on vacation, where I play golf. Uh, you know, all those kind of consumer type of things. Uh, well, I mean, I, what, what I always say to people is that I, I think there is a lot of um, analogous, uh, well, there's a lot of parallel between, um, you know, the, the, the desktop publishing revolution in the 80s and, and the 3D printing now. And I think, you know, for a long time, people thought that, uh, that uh, printing on your desktop was going to eliminate the need for offset presses uh, in the world, which was absurd. Yeah. And turned yeah. out to be not true, right? And it, sure. people also thought that the availability of software for this kind of thing was going to make uh, graphic designers useless because suddenly everybody's a graphic designer. And clearly that's not true either. However, yeah. you know, with, uh, with photo printing, folks are perfectly happy to go down to, to, you know, Walgreens or Staples or wherever and get their, their, their photos printed. And that way they don't have to, mm -hmm. own, you know, have the overhead of owning a machine. And I, so I think it's not yep. just about... Uh, technical know-how. I think it's also just about you know economy and and it, it simplicity. Makes, simplicity, yeah, it makes a lot of yeah. sense. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the same thing when when, <laughs> when the printers when the printers started to get cheaper and cheaper. Uh, 3D printers. People thought that the bureaus were going to go out of business. That nobody was ever going to start to, to use a bureau anymore because everybody would have a, a machine in the home. And what happened is that the bureaus got really good at making very high quality parts, and they made a business for themselves you know, making parts that people would have a hard time making their own 3D printer and they kind of survive that way. So, you know, it, it just because uh, it, it is changing. And I think that I do believe that the bigger growth, that the, the, the tail uh, in the curve where the greatest uh, usage, the greatest number of people using the technology will be through their local stores like Staples. And, we're, you know, so the deal with Staples, um, you know, we were in contact with Staples we went on the assumption that Staples were going after this consumer play, um, you know, because they would have a lot of consumers coming in and using their using their services to the regular stores. Uh, and, and we know from in the past that uh, our competitors have tried to uh, get into the likes of Staples. I'm not saying Staples, but other companies where you'd walk in and get uh, potentially get stuff printed in a kind of a repo graphics arena. Um, but they weren't really able to pull it off uh, either it was because of the materials, uh, you know, or the extractions or whatever was needed, but mostly down to the price point. By the time you get a, a component, a part printed out uh, on a kind of a one-off basis that would enable the consumer to come in and buy it without them having to pay a couple of hundred dollars for it, it just wasn't really working out. Whereas with air technology, with the color, even though the color adds a little bit of price to it, but you get a very high color uh, you get a part that's very durable and very smooth. Uh, and then, you know, the price point means that, you know, the, the stores can make a bit of markup on it and the customer can right. still afford to buy it without having to, you know, think too much about right. it. You know, so uh, when we ran the numbers uh, and when they seen the quality of the color, it was just an obvious thing uh, for them to do. And they're very progressive. Um, you know, they really have thrown... A lot of resources in behind it, and they're really going for it. So uh, it's it's great, and they have huge expertise in doing this in the two D printing arena. Uh, you know, managing files and uh, data, and managing regular print. So right, uh, they, they got a few reams of paper uh, laying around there. They would have a few left over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when do you think we're going to see this coming to the U.S. and uh, for uh, cost estimate, what might the the cost of a full color print that is around the size of a coffee uh, cup might be. Yeah, I, yeah, I can't uh, like in terms of the cost. I mean, that's obviously Ballpark, the state. Really I mean, the, Are we talking about ten dollars, thirty dollars? Monday 100? and fifteen bucks. <laughs> yeah, you're you're talking. I would imagine you're talking in the in the tens. You know, 10, okay. 20, 30, something like that for something that was you know a good good size. Right. Like put it this, uh -huh. you know. It, it, well, uh, you know, we'd have to wait and see what way they're going to come out. Well, it had to be reasonably but, priced. I'm yeah, sure. but that's the whole thing. They, they, you know, there's no point in having parts that are coming out that are a couple of hundred bucks because right. then just people won't print. But then on the, uh, as a term, so when that will come out in the US, um, again, that's driven obviously by Staples as a company. Right, Monday, um, Tuesday. But, they, but there is... <laughs> something like that. <laughs> it'll be... Uh, 
It'll be on the Toros Day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there one, one last <laughs> question for you, Connor. Uh, have you got, do you, you know, do you have uh, any known plans to branch out into other markets at the moment? Anything you can share with us? And no, not really. I mean, oh. we're, you know, with this, with this new product, um, you know, we're concentrating on this product now with the color. So, uh-huh. um, you know, there, there will be new machines that will come in down the line that we're kind of working here in the R&D. But, uh, the, I would like yeah. to see an app, you know, at least, uh, you know, if I was over in, a, in Ireland, I could shoot off a, a print with my app over to the Staples and go pick it up. Yeah. That's yeah, nice. I mean, it, it's going to be very exciting. I mean, the, the next, like there's trials going on there at the moment and it's eventually it's going to be, it's very quickly, it's going to be going online. They'll be opening it up online and um, very soon people will be able to get their prints done. So That is super uh, exciting. That is great. Yeah. Very, very exciting stuff. Yeah. Congratulations, McCormick, by the way. Yeah. Uh, MCore Technologies. Thank you so much for being on the show with us. Yes. Today. No problem. It was it was good fun talking to you, Adam and Josh. It was uh good questions and um Yeah. It was good talking to you. Excellent. Yeah. I hope we can do it again sometime. Thanks again. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Adam, I, 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 uh, I got to say, that was a fun and interesting and fun interview. Mm, it was fun and interesting and fun. It's, it's true. <laughs> you know, in fact, Adam, at talking with Connor was even more yep. fun than that time you attempted to snort peppercorns and shoot them <laughs> out your eyelids. <laughs> Which time? Which time, Josh? <laughs> All three. (laughs) If you'd like to send me new eyelids, uh, as everyone does these days, please address those to Adam and send them over here. Uh, I will most surely put them in rotation with my other favorite eyelids. That's that's just weird. (laughs) The no eyelids. That's weird. You know what? Prosthetics is... (laughs) Prosthetic eyelids. Yeah. (laughs) Nice. All right. We love your comments. Uh, Please leave them and let us know what you think, uh, what you want to see on the show, and what you'd like to hear about at engineerversusdesigner.com or on the EVD YouTube or Vimeo channels. And don't forget to stop by the EVD Google Plus community. And uh, if you'd like to see uh, some, you know, see us really sad and confused and start to talk to ourselves and create characters like the Smoth Mealer, please be sure to like us, plus one us. Tweet us or whatever else as social media has been correlated with losing your mind, screaming at yourself, and recording it. This show was edited by the masterful Simon Martin. If you like the tunes on the show, check out the Solid Smack Radio, Mm -hmm. (laughs) where we'll bring the latest mix for your workday week. Yeah. Well, this is actually one of our... This is one of my favorite new products we've been doing. I love this thing. Got that to listen is. To that every, every Tuesday week. at SolidSmack.com. Yep. We'll see you next week. And remember, without designers, engineers would be working in cluttered uh, office, boring office environments built for practicality, but smelling yeah. strangely of belly button fungus everywhere. Of mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> and without engineers... Industrial designers uh-huh. would spend more time assessing a space rather than mm-hmm. working in it. <laughs> that's that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> I'm I'm assessing the space between my fist and your face. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> yeah. Nice comeback, Adam. You are on your A game today, buddy. A game. You brought Thanks, it. Man. Well, you know, all morning I was really rocking a B plus game, and <laughs> and I felt like you know I better take it up a notch. And the next notch above B plus, it turns out is my A game. <laughs> a production of EBD Media. <laughs>